BAM is a communications agency that believes stories move the world. We move stories forward for technology-driven brands that challenge, change, and create entire industries. Today, we're chatting with Caitlin Durkosh, Director of Communications at Greylock Partners. Before joining Greylock, Caitlin led communications for Uber's consumer experience and the company's new mobility businesses, including bikes and scooters. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Dear Banff, the podcast for PR and marketing pros such as yourself. Thanks for being here today. We have wonderful Caitlin, as mentioned, from Greylock to answer all the questions that are in our inbox this week. And there are a lot, Caitlin. So thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Super excited. Let's dig in. First one. Dear Banff, I'm at a startup with more than a thousand employees. Things have been rough amid the pandemic and I'm struggling to balance, quote, the good news that is coming out about our company alongside equally, quote unquote, bad news. I don't want to describe too much, but for instance, we did a round of layoffs and then a week later got a rubber stamp on a major acquisition. Of course, context is everything. So explaining the why for all these swings of news is quite a dance. But do you have a playbook that you could suggest for the pace, way, or even process to handle the good and bad news that is happening right now? Way to start off with a great one, Caitlin. Yes, for sure. I mean, everybody, every PR pro knows that balancing good news and and bad news is always going to be tough. I think you really need to be sensitive to how your employees are feeling and also very thoughtful in terms of what you think the external reaction is going to be kind of when you pair these two pieces of news and kind of how quickly they come out back to back. I also think, you know, just because you think of something as good news, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to land that way externally. You have to be really careful about seeming tone deaf or like you're trying to bury the bad news and that it's all just rainbows and puppies at your company. You know, I think people will definitely see through that and really that type of behavior can take a hit on your reputation kind of in the long term. So I think it's always important to go back to first principles. So when making a call on whether or not to do PR and and strategy behind it, it's important to stay centered around the goals. So what are the goals of announcing kind of the good news versus the bad news? I like to remind people that getting positive coverage isn't necessarily a goal in itself. It's a tactic to achieve the goal. So you really need to think through the why in terms of what you're announcing and and what you really want to get out of it. I think in terms of specific playbooks, maybe it's um, working with just one reporter that you really trust, giving them an exclusive and not trying to make a big thing out of the good news. Maybe if it's specific to an acquisition, let the company that's acquiring you actually lead and run the PR and kind of drive the strategy so that you have to deal less with kind of answering those tough questions of, Why are you touting an acquisition when you just laid off, you know, a bunch of people? So I think those are just a couple of things I would keep in mind and potential strategies to explore. Yeah. One thing we did advise on is to even consider just because you have a piece of news, good or bad, do you have to do anything about it? What's the why of even pushing it out? So I know quite a few companies, especially in the startup landscape, will not announce a funding round. Now it'll get picked up in you know legal documents, for example, but not to make a big push. And they don't even release that news, even for months. And that's okay. So you first, I think the biggest question is, why do we want to push this? Good, bad, neutral. Mm-hmm. And then from there, assess, as you're saying, the context, who are all the stakeholders? What do they think to current employees, to VCs, external, I mean, all, all the different stakeholders and always go back to the why. Why are we doing this? Why do we want to make a push of this now? Is it even the right timing for now? Yep, exactly. And I also think there are more channels and audiences than just kind of the media. So if it's balancing, you know, a round of layoffs with, say, a new executive hire that you're really excited about, maybe you do some really killer internal comms, have a great Q&A session with them, kind of send, you know, send some thoughtful notes to your VCs and and kind of your other uh, immediate groups, but maybe do a news story with that person for their first product launch or Q&A with them kind of a little bit down the road. So there's lots of different ways to think about it and approach it. But yes, kind of would always recommend coming back to 
why are we doing this? And does this really make sense for us right now? Mm -hmm. So true. Next question, Caitlin. Here we go. Dear Banff, as a PR person, I'm used to staffing interviews with clients to listen in and take notes. I'm wondering what I should do if something comes up on an interview that I know is a question my client cannot answer or if they're struggling at what point and in what way should I chime in, if at all? Will this sour my relationship with the reporter? How do I navigate these tricky situations? And Caitlin, you've been at Uber for a while, so not now at this point, but have been there. So I'm sure you have some relevance to this. Yeah, I think there are a couple of things you can do from sort of both sides. So from the reporter side, as well as the executive side, from the reporter side, I think it's okay to have a conversation with the reporter ahead of time. So look, I know you're talking to X, but we'd really appreciate if you focus on the topic you reached out about or the topic we pitched you on, or you can approach it another way in the sense of, I really wanted to give you a heads up that X is not going to answer any questions on these two topics. Obviously, we can't stop the reporter from asking about those, but at least you can manage expectations ahead of time in terms of what your spokesperson will and can't um, speak to. Mm -hmm. So, and then kind of on the the executive or the spokesperson side, I, I think it's so important to just really prep them, even on things that you don't want them to answer or things that they can't answer. So, you know, for instance, if you have a product feature or a product leader, excuse me, announcing a new feature, but you also have a bunch of rumors on acquisitions or layoffs, make sure they have the one liner to address those. So, if it's an acquisition, maybe it's look, we're not comment, commenting on rumors, but what I can tell you is we're really excited about the direction that our business is going. And I think it's also important to remind execs when prepping them that it's okay to say, that's a great question. Let me think about it or let me get back to you. I think it's particularly relevant that they do that if it's a super tough question or if it's a question that has an answer that could kind of have this snowball effect and result in sort of unintended consequences or maybe a different or bigger news cycle that you weren't planning. I mean, overall, I I think my philosophy is that I really believe that most reporters are very, very reasonable people. Sure, you know, they may try and ask a question that your spokesperson doesn't want to or can't answer. But if you step in and you say, hey, that's not not something we can answer per our chat earlier, I, I truly don't think they would hold it against you. It's all about really just managing expectations and being clear and upfront and trying to establish some sort of ground rules ahead of time so that there are fewer surprises. And if something does come up, you can just quickly address it and move on. Mm -hmm. I have not seen nor been witness myself nor heard of any situations here where interrupting or jumping in on behalf of an executive works out well. It's just, there's so many landmines to that from their credibility to now you're not the one on the interview. So to Caitlin's point, all that prep, all the what's game, what's not, again, that's dependent on your relationship with the media person, but that's fair game to do. And then you got to just prep the heck out of anyone you're going to put on an interview. That's how you diminish the risk here and get yourself in any hot water. You need to make sure that that team member or team members, whoever you're putting in front of media has the lay of the land. So they know how to pivot a question. They know how to block. They know how to redirect, get back to it. Caitlin, to your point on just like, oh, you know, it's a head of product, let's say, and they're asking about something about an HR layoff or, or some topic totally out of left field. Hey, I'm not the best person to answer that, but I can put you in touch with so-and-so who can address all those questions. Always giving them another point to get more information can be very helpful in that situation. So writer who wrote us in this question on this, totally good to listen and take notes. I wouldn't put yourself on the line to interject, especially with a a key executive. But to Caitlin's point, it's all about the prep and then on both sides, the media person, if you can, when you can, and then also the executive you're putting forward. So yeah. All right, let's get into our next question. Here we go. Dear Banff, my client was unhappy with the publication story they believed to be misleading. And instead of working with his agency, he reached out directly to the editor, questioning why this was done, how it happened, and demanding a change be made. When this action is made aware to you, how do you handle this with the employee? And what steps do you take to mend the relationship with the journalists? Mm. Sure. So I'm a little less familiar with this type of question from 
answering from the agency side. So I'll kind of give you my point of view from a comms person within a company and we can kind of go from there. Yes, yes. So I think this is a great time to implement an internal policy in terms of interacting with the press if there isn't one already. Mm -hmm. Basically, my view is a company should always have a clear policy in terms of who talks to the press and the process in place in terms of how that happens. And this is something you need execs to be on board with And it needs to be socialized with employees. That way, if something like this does happen, you kind of have grounds to stand on given this internal policy. From kind of like the reporter relationship standpoint, if this does happen, it's obviously mortifying. And I hope (laughs) that it doesn't happen to anybody. But I would just call them and apologize, kind of acknowledge that it was out of line for the employee to contact them directly and say, you're really working to make sure this doesn't happen again. At this point, you also really need to decide whether it's worth trying to get a correction or doing kind of whatever that employee who reached out directly is trying to do, or if you really, really want to focus on salvaging the relationship. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the one thing that you need to decide, but definitely make sure you have an internal policy in place in terms of who can talk to the press and how that interaction takes place. And then just be as apologetic and acknowledge that it was out of line as much as you can. Mm -hmm. Did you experience this at all being internal comms at Uber? Did this ever happen? No, it didn't. It didn't happen given we had a policy in place and we were pretty clear and direct about it. And I would say most people were very respectful of that. Something that did happen that might be relevant to share that is kind of tangentially connected was I was doing an announcement with a couple of reporters and, you know, we had agreed on an embargo time of like, say, 9 a.m. Pacific, but we had marketing that was also kind of working on a parallel track and they had uploaded an email that was going to be sent to consumers but the the timing in the system was on Eastern time. So the email went out a little bit ahead of the embargo and there started to be some social chatter. So while not exactly the same, it was still still this instance of, I agreed on something with a, with a reporter. They had written a story. We were all waiting for kind of the embargo time to publish and then kind of word got out earlier based on an error on our end. Mm. Um, And kind of what I just said was called them all and apologized and said, I'm so, so sorry. I explained what happened. I think it's really important to just be kind of like honest and humble in these types of situations. And while, you know, I don't think anybody was happy about the fact that it happened, I think they were much more understanding if I had not just acknowledged it at all. Mm -hmm. And and for what it's worth, I had worked with them all again in the future. So Oh, good. Yeah, the relationship was definitely not kind of tarnished in the long run. Mm. One other question is to that could be helpful for this person is when, and you may not even know this, but when was such a policy put in place at Uber? Was it when you had 50 employees, 500? Do you know? I'm just trying to think of this person, like how soon could they recommend like, hey guys, we got to have an internal policy here. I think you should do it The second that you start doing kind of PR or as a company, you come out of stealth. I mean, I think even if you're still in stealth, you should have something in place or some sort of resource in place for employees. I mean, at that point, if you're only kind of five employees and somebody gets a media inquiry kind of sniffing around about the company, I would hope that that person would share it with the rest of the team and kind of agree on what to do. But I just think the sooner, the better. And it's obviously something as you grow and as teams evolve, you're going to have to keep reminding people. I just think it doesn't ever hurt to have policies in place as soon as you can get them implemented. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Be ahead of the game here. Proactive. Always a good policy. Okay, Caitlin, we've got two more. Here we go. Dear Banff, please help me here. I run communications at a public tech company and we work with quite a number of external agencies. My issue Now that I've been in my role for six plus months, I can clearly see how one PR agency we have has been kept on for way too long. My CEO has a relationship with the agency CEO, so this is a buddy-buddy deal. This agency, though, is just not delivering. Is it my place to point this out loudly and directly? How loudly? This agency falls under my budget and my KPIs, but I'm not sure I can end the relationship given the CEO to CEO connection. By the way, I don't even think the CEOs even know of this issue. Sure. So 
I think you absolutely need to have an honest conversation with your CEO that's rooted in facts. Yeah. And I think you need to come to that conversation with a recommendation on next steps. I mean, after all, the CEO or whoever hired you did in fact hire you to run communications and the function. So they should be trusting of your strategy mm-hmm. and overall guidance related to anything in your your purview. So I pull together a doc or Google Drive, kind of whatever the best format is for you and keep a list of any concerning behavior, examples, you know, of when they didn't deliver and kind of any and all notes you have. If you have any colleagues that are also working with the agency, pull them for whatever they can find or their kind of anecdotes or pieces of feedback. This will help your case when you go to the CEO to show that it's not just a matter of like liking or disliking or getting a bad vibe, but you have proof that they're not actually creating the results that they're supposed to. And I would also come to it with a recommendation on on next steps. So if you know you want to say, hey, kind of here's what I'm seeing, but I'd like to give them three more months with these specific KPIs. And if they don't kind of meet them, can we agree to terminate the contract? Or if you want to do it immediately, that's totally up to you. Just make sure you come to that conversation with facts and with a recommendation so that that you can feel good about it in the conversation with your CEO. I mean, quite frankly, if your CEO or the executive isn't willing to hear you out or take your input and recommendation, I think you should really think long and hard about whether this is someone and a company you want to work for. Yeah. Bye-bye. Time for a new job. Seriously, because because this can only showcase one of the many, perhaps, patterns you will find at this company. What I'm mentioning is this is probably not an isolated situation if there's this buddy-buddy, tick-for-tack type of situation going. I'm sure it's not the only isolated one. I mention this all the time. It's like people are behavior-based. So if they're treating someone over there, one colleague a certain way, it's unlikely that it's the only colleague they're treating a certain way. There's likely to be a pattern happening. So I'd be interested in seeing if you recognize this pattern elsewhere in the organization. That's a little bit out of the scope of this. To your recommendations, Caitlin, coming with facts, coming with information, keeping in mind too, I'd say for this, that the information you provide, especially if it's written, especially if it's in a deck or in any form or function, is probably going to be forwarded along. It's probably going to be brought up with the buddy buddy CEO, like, hey, my person over here is saying this, this, and this. Is this true? So keep that in mind. That's just always a good rule of thumb of, hey, anything you put in writing, anything you put anywhere, anywhere, whether email, in a Slack message, whatever, can be used. And so consider that correctly. Also to the fact-based initiative, dance lightly on this, but yes, facts would be great. I'd also say too, to just add to that, depending on your experience that you have, if you've worked with other agencies of any sort, and we don't know the full context here, if this is maybe the first experience the writer writes in that they have a lot of external agencies. One, you could point to the experience you've had with other agencies before and say, hey, in those relationships, the ones that have been good, they've delivered X, Y, and Z, which we are not seeing here. Second thing you could mention is, okay, among these other external agencies that we have, A, B, and C agencies are doing these things, but this one is not. So comparatively within our own group of the one servicing right now, how come I have to chase this one to get on a call three times, whereas all our other ones consistently communicate with me and are servicing us at the level we demand? So you know what I'm saying? Like you're doing like an internal review factually of what else is happening with the other agencies, but then you're also looking at your previous experience, which we're assuming you were hired for. Yep, exactly. And just kind of one more one more thing on the, I know you made the point of if it's happening within your kind of function or your org, it's probably happening throughout the rest of the org. And I also think if it's happening beyond just that, if it's happening on this particular thing, if you're disagreeing with the CEO, the CEO is not willing to hear you out. It's probably foreshadowing what your relationship is going to continue to be like. So if they're not willing to mm-hmm. to see you as the expert and give you autonomy to run your function the way that it deserves to be run, then definitely some red flags as well. True. And then run for the hills if you can. Okay. Last question for today, Caitlin, here we go. The CEO I work for at my company is obsessed with what the competition is doing, particularly in the media. This obsession though has turned a bit manic as now my CEO only wants herself 
to be in media interviews and so forth. Previously, we had our CTO, head of people, and others on our team put in front of media. For context, we have about 200 employees and have a real solid bench of badasses here. How can we temper my CEO and rationalize that having more of our team on interviews would be good for us? Yeah, this is an interesting one. So I think, and you may not be able to really kind of get inside your CEO's head, but if you can try and get any insight as to why does the CEO like want to be front and center all the time? Is it because he or she thinks that they're the only one that can get the interest of the reporters and the media has no other interest in talking to the rest of the bench? Kind of what specifically is their thinking behind needing to get front and center? I think it's always great to show diversity and highlight as many people as you can within within a company. I think it's good good from a culture standpoint and good from a hiring standpoint for kind of future employees to see all of the other people that are doing great work with inside the organization. And I think kind of internally, it can be super frustrating from an exec standpoint Mm -hmm. if they never get a chance to go out there and talk about their area of expertise or be able to kind of showcase the work that they're doing or the work that their teams are doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I know I've said this a couple of times during this conversation, but I think it again goes back to kind of A lot of the majority of the time, your comms goals are going to be much more than just focus on the competition. It's going to be hiring. It's going to be kind of showing your innovative um, signaling to investors. So I think you also have to try and keep that in mind and, and use that as an argument when proposing that other spokespeople go out and represent the company to your CEO. I also think if at all helpful to remind that person is people don't necessarily always want to work for a CEO who is always front and center and doesn't, you know, share the share the limelight. Um, and I also think if there is ever a leadership change, you want to make sure that people know and are familiar with other people in the bench so that you're not faced with this sort of like narrative that, oh my God, our, our founder or our CEO has left. So the, the company is just crumbling because there's no one else that could possibly run it or be out there to represent them. Yeah, that's a dangerous spot to put yourself so far out there that you inextricably become part of the brand and people can't imagine the company without it. It's too risky, in my opinion. Secondly, it sounds a little bit like ego is at play here, perhaps we can infer that. So this is a little maybe out of the lines, but what you could maybe convey to the CEO here is, hey, you know, when we have an opportunity to bring on other people that are not you, they are doing PR for the company and for you, CEO. They could be mentioning, oh my gosh, your leadership, oh, the values of this company, oh, what we are solving, all that good stuff. And that sounds much better than it, than it coming from you. Don't you want that? That is maybe a different angle to take here on this approach that might open the eyes of the CEO and go like, oh yeah, you know what? It's probably a good thing when, when other people besides me are talking about me and the thing I built here. Hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? A little internal PR. Well, and also it's good to remind your CEO, listen, you are running this amazing company. There is so much work to be done internally. Like it's not the best use of your time to be talking to any and every outlet that wants to reach out to us. Yeah. So if you can also kind of remind that person from that perspective, and if you're a CEO that's, that's constantly doing interviews, people are going to ask you about stuff that you're not necessarily wanting to talk about at that moment. So if you're, you know, doing a launch, they may start asking you about all of these other things and it can taint the story. So I think Mm -hmm. just reminding that person that having the right spokespeople talk about kind of their area of expertise will also give you better results from a media coverage perspective too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, Caitlin, we've solved everything for the week. Oh man, new, new weeks, new issues. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much for being on today. This was really great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Dear Banff, the advice podcast for PR and marketing pros like you. Our show was created by BAM, a PR and marketing agency headquartered in San Diego and New York City. The music you're enjoying today was composed by Tiffany Dizon, produced by Daniel Kessner, and played by San Diego Symphony's Art of Alon. Thank you to our podcast production team at Citizen Recording. If you have a tough PR and marketing question you'd like us to answer, 
please write to us at bamtheagency.com forward slash Dear Banff. Don't forget the F. We'll be back next Monday with another episode of Dear Banff. Until then.